Let's get into this, this morning's word. I want to show you a picture, a visual. In fact, it's a movie poster. Very often, visuals help us remember things, and I'm kind of hoping that this movie poster or the concept of this movie is going to deposit something in your life that, A, you remember, and B, hopefully helps you for the rest of your life. How bizarre is that? So let's take a look at this movie, The Pursuit of Happiness. I don't know if you've watched that film it was from 2006. If you haven't, or it's been a long time, I really recommend the film. Obviously, Will Smith was the main actor. He's got a little boy in, in the story, and that's his real son, by the way, which is just an interesting piece of information. But it's one of those films, it's a feel-good film. It's a good family film. It'll have you laughing and crying at the same time, I can promise you. Really, really a great film. I do, however, have one small criticism about this film. And in the light of entertainment, in the light of Hollywood, I confess it's a rather pathetic piece of criticism, but in the light of your life, it's pretty important. You see, the, the plot was great, the acting was great, the music was great, but there's one concept that they raise that has been ruining lives for thousands of years. You say, what on earth is that? The title, This Pursuit of Happiness. We pursue happiness. I pursue happiness, the guy next door pursues happiness. The smartest man in the world pursued happiness, you pursue happiness, was disappointing, frustrating, and sometimes with devastating results. You see, this is kind of what I need us to click this morning. The pursuit of happiness leads to the prize of sorrow. The pursuit of happiness leads you, or you could say takes you to a destination of sorrow. Say, what an uplifting sermon to get 29 going. I sat with um, a young guy some time ago. He was quite desperate and quite uh, distraught and really was looking for help. He was a married guy and his wife wanted a divorce. And he was a father as well, a little boy. And I spent some time, and I'm asking him questions gently, just tr trying to see how can I help him, how can I help the situation. And I must be honest, it was very strange, because as I'm asking, as I'm probing, I'm, I'm battling to find something here. This looks like a really a good guy, and he's really trying to be a good husband, and it sounds like he's a great father, and he's good-looking, and he's a good provider. And he even said to me, he said, I'm not perfect. If you see something that I need to tweak or change, I'm open to correction. And I'm like, whoa, I'm not sure. So I thought, okay, here's what I'll do. I'll spend some time with the wife, just meet her alone, have a cup of coffee. Because very often in these situations, you can imagine you get an entire different story on the other side. Well, this was the weirdest. I never got a different story on the other side at all. In fact, she was pretty complimentary about him. She was like, he's a good father. He's, You're a great husband. Yeah, I've got one or two tiny little things, but nothing major. And here's the line that she said that kind of pulled the carpet from under my feet. And I quote, she said, I'm just not happy, and I deserve to be happy, so I want out. And she filed for a divorce. She's not the first or the last to pursue happiness. The problem is the pursuit of happiness leads to the prize or the destination of sorrow. You see, this is how you and I think it works. We want this prize. We want this destination of happiness. And the way to do that is you have to climb on a train. Okay, not this little train in particular, okay? But what train? I call it the more train. The more train, if I can get on the more train, I'm gonna get to where I wanna be, I will be happy. And for everyone, your train is pretty different may have multiple coaches, but if I could just have more money, then I'm going to be happy. If I could just have more time off or more recreation or more sports in my life, then I'm going to be happy. If I could just have more meaningful relationships, or if some of you are sitting, if I could just have a relationship, then I'll be happy. If I could just have more sex, or if I could just have more recognition, or if I could just have more of a corporate ladder to climb, then I'll be happy. Just more. Now, what is so fascinating is God records for us the greatest more train to have ever existed. 
It was, it's never been matched, and quite frankly, I don't think you'll ever come close to matching this moor train. And he shows us how an individual climbs on this moor train, thinking this moor train will get to the destination of happiness, and it doesn't. And I think you know who this individual is. It's Solomon. So this morning, what I want to do just briefly is I want to unpack his moor train for you. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and use a bit of a modern slant and throw one or two modern facts and figures just to make sure that it really impacts us. And if at any time you think I'm exaggerating, you're more than welcome to go and check me out this week in 2 Chronicles or in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let's have a look at Solomon's moor train because there's so many coaches to his moor train. Firstly, there's the whole thing of more pleasure. If we could just have more pleasure. Now, if I say to you more pleasure, of course, pleasure is different for everyone, but I think he ticks all of the boxes. What about the more pleasure in, in music? You see, he had access to the top artists and musicians in the known world at that time. So for you and I, that would be like having Coldplay or you 2 coming to play at your party on Friday night for you. Or it would be like John Legend busy playing piano in the background where you and your wife have dinner. Or it would be the London Philharmonic Orchestra playing the Blue Danube or the Messiah's Handel to wake you up in the morning. And besides which, he wrote several songs. Two of them are recorded in Scripture. So if we kind of equate that to a modern setting, that means he would have won two Grammys. And those would have been on the top of the UK or US charts. What about more humor? the pleasure that we get in humor. Well, he was permanently surrounded by comedians to make sure that he was laughing all the time. So for you and I, that means we're permanently surrounded by Trevor Noah, Jerry Seinfeld, and Mr. Bean. Well, that's quite cool. What about more pleasure in alcohol? Well, the other day, someone showed me a macro catalog. I couldn't believe this. They were selling a bottle of whiskey here for a Christmas present, maybe if you were pondering for your husband, I'm no expert in this stuff or whatever you, but I thought it was a printing mistake. The bottle was worth 700,000 rand from Macro. So him and I, really stupid nerds, calculate how, how much does it cost to sip every time on this whiskey. It's about five to 10,000 rand for every sip you take. Okay, Glenn Fiddich, Johnny Wilker Black, I don't know, okay? But, Let's go back to Solomon. He had that stuff on tap, like water in a house. What about more pleasure in achieving things, in doing projects? Some people really get a kick out of that. Well, this gentleman oversaw the building of municipalities and parks and dams and palaces and cities and God's temple. Can I just zoom in for a second a little bit on his palace, his home? You see, that took... 13 years and 150,000 individuals to construct. If you go to the palace of the lost city, Sun City, Sol Kersner spent two years building the lost city, lost palace, and 5,000 individuals. Now, fair enough, there's a huge technology gap between the 20th, 20th century and 3,000 years ago, but I think I can safely say two years versus 13 years, 150 odd thousand versus 5,000, I think that bridges the gap. So there we go, your home is the palace of the lost city. Pleasure in sex, 300 concubines, 700 wives. If one of them has a headache, <laughs> there's 999 others to choose from. In fact, okay, I didn't think too far down the road, but just stick with me here. If you spend one night with one lady, why would you do that anyway? But let's just stay there. One night with one lady, that means the next time you see that individual is almost three years later. Longer than a cell phone contract. <laughs> How's that for more pleasure? What about more knowledge? If I said 
to you this morning. I just want to congratulate an individual here this morning who's just earned his doctorate. Now, no offense, I'm not insulting you as a public, okay? Just statistically, there are very few individuals here with doctorates. Would you agree? But then I go to say, listen, and they've just uh, received a doctorate in literature, astronomy, theology, physiology, psychology, and engineering. You'd say that's impossible. Well, experts say that's the knowledge that this man had. In fact, the Bible records that as he spoke in general conversation, his mates would pay him because they were so astounded in what they heard. What about more power? Well, this is three odd thousand years ago. It's very different to now. Your king had ultimate power. Whatever he says goes. No one questions it. There's no one who's going to take you to the constitutional court. You've got a massive, massive army that backs you, so it's like the United States, all the nuclear weapons are behind us. Whatever I say as an individual goes. How's that? Unchecked power. What about more relationships? So then I go back to this crazy stat of 300 concubines and 700 wives. And I'm thinking, I don't know if you've ever thought, what's up with 300 concubines? Why didn't he just marry the concubines? Look, you can't turn around and say, well, weddings are a bit expensive. I mean, that's not the issue here. And this is my theory. I'm thinking, then obviously those concubines were not for intellectual stimulation or good conversation. He just appreciated them for their eyes, okay? 700 wives points to relationships. And if it isn't a direct relationship with her, then he married that girl for a connection to someone else or to royalty. That's way more impressive than 700 friends on Facebook. Let's stop at the last one, the more train of more wealth. I don't even know where to start here. Okay, firstly, I need to ask for your forgiveness. I'm going to give you some figures in dollar terms. Because when I sat down and researched, I thought maybe to make it even more realistic for us that we really comprehend this guy's more train, I should times it by 14 and a half so we get rand terms. And when I started typing that in and timesing it by 14 and a half, I got to figures that I'm thinking, I don't even know how to say that. I'm going to sound like Jacob Zuma. It's, it's not going to work. <laughs> okay, so we're going to stick to dollars. Bill Gates today is worth about $100 billion. Okay, I'll help you with one thing. When I say a billion, it's nine zeros. If I say a trillion, it's 12 zeros. $100 billion, that's cute, because in today's terms, Solomon would have been $2.2 trillion. Way more than South Africa's GDP. In fact, the Bible talks about that he received 25 tons of gold per year for 39 years on the throne. 25 tons of gold is worth $1.1 billion. The Queen of Sheba comes to visit him. What does she do? She brings five tons of gold. That's the weight of an elephant of gold. Slightly more valuable than the box of chocolates that you would have brought. <laughs> I'm just talking about gold. There's spices, there's clothes, there's silver. In fact, the Bible said silver was so common in his kingdom that it became pretty valueless. I think he's pretty loaded. How's that for insane pleasure, mind-blowing knowledge, unchecked power, relationships, extraordinary wealth? Can I just have a bit of fun? Just pretend with me. Sorry, ladies, just stick with me for a second. So let's put this all together. You're a, a man in the 21st century. You live in the palace of the lost city, and cold plays playing in the foyer a song that you wrote, and you welcome through the door Trevor Noah, who's going to be joining you for dinner, and then you go and handpick the cutest blonde, the most gorgeous brunette, and the sexiest redhead you can find, who will be keeping you company tonight in more ways than one, and when you're chatting to your guests that night, you're talking to them about a nebulous star and its projection to the universe that you've discovered while you're sipping Glenn Fittich, and at the same time, they pay for you. You don't need the money, but it's cool anyway, and the water that's being supplied to your palace is from an irrigation system that you designed, surely you'd be happy. Surely 
that train takes you to the pursuit of the destination of happiness. Come on. In fact, we have a quote from this king. Listen to this. Everything I wanted, I took. I never said no to myself. Wow. But we have another quote from this man. In fact, theologians, experts tell us it's written at the end of his life. The book of Ecclesiastes. He's an old man. And right in the beginning of this book that he kicks off, the first verse is just an intro. Here's the second verse. You know what he says? Meaningless, meaningless. It's utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. You're going to read in your Bible, you may have a different word for meaningless. You may have their vanity, or you may have useless, or empty, or some translations even say smoke. And the reason for that is, in the ancient Hebrew, it's a very difficult word for us to translate in the 21st century into one word. You actually need a whole little description for it. Now, that happens from time to time when you translate from one language to another. Uh, if you had an American friend, and you walked with him and said, look at that Teenage couple kerfuffling in the corner there. He'd look at you and say, what is that? You'll say, oh, but uh, I'd have to explain that to you. You can't just give it. There's no one English word for kerfuffling. Okay? you with me. Now, don't lose me. Okay, so let's go back to meaningless. There's no one word, but there's a whole lot of, like, it's, it's almost like everything is, ah. Oh, everything is smoke and mirrors. It's a mirage. It's disappointing. It's useless. Everything is opposite to happiness, even though he climbed on this more train. So where does that leave you and I? Your happiness, not really important to God. You're kind of destined to be frustrated and disappointed and really struggle. No, no. But this is what I need you to catch this morning. Happiness is a byproduct of pursuing something else. Happiness is a byproduct of pursuing something else. It's almost like buying a very marked product. You buy that, you pursue that, and they throw something in for free. That's what happens. You pursue something else, and you get happiness thrown in for free. So let's have a look. What do we pursue then? So I'm reading from 1 Peter Chapter 3 this morning, verse 10. Now, what's rather interesting here, here we've got Jesus' good friend Peter, a really simple fisherman who writes this letter. But what is so interesting about the section I'm going to read to you this morning is Peter is quoting directly from Psalm 34. He's quoting David, someone that lived hundreds of years before him. So I just find it interesting that you can read exactly the same words in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So let's have a look at what 1 Peter 3 verse 10 says. If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, you almost say, okay, I'm all ears. Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain that. The eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and His ears are open to their prayers. But the Lord turns His face against those who do evil. Can I just sum that up? How I interpret that little paragraph. Just, I want to put it like in a little pricey, in a little summary, how I understand what both Peter and this king were saying that day. Pursue holiness and wisdom, and happiness will be thrown in for good measure. That's the summary of what I've read to you. Pursue holiness, pursue wisdom, and happiness gets thrown in for good measure. And of course, when you say words like holiness and wisdom in the 21st century, that we're a little bit off, you know, well, we can understand Facebook and cheesecake. Holiness, wisdom, okay, where, where do we go with that? What do we do with that? Okay, so together, let's zoom in first on when I say pursue holiness. 
Let's look at that first. Now, some of you are sitting and thinking, and when I say holiness, that's quite a Christianese word. Let's maybe just say it's just goodness on steroids. Okay? It's a very simplistic definition, but we want to pursue that. And you're saying, I'm not so sure I agree with you, Mark, because that sounds like work based salvation. That sounds legalistic, where you're trying to earn God's approval. You're trying to earn salvation. No, that's definitely not what I'm saying. I totally agree with you. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. You cannot be good to earn His good. No, it doesn't work that way. It's a free gift. You don't deserve it. In fact, God describes it like a jacket, like a robe that He puts over you of holiness, of righteousness, of goodness, you, can't, you don't deserve it. You definitely haven't earned the jacket. You can't pay for it. It is so priceless, you can't even make it. But, but there's something else I want to point out to you. Paul writes two letters to two of his churches that he's established. One in Philippi, which is Greece. Another word, uh, the other one is to Ephesus, which is now known as Turkey. And they're two awesome letters. But he says two lines in each of these letters that say something rather powerful. So let's take a look. Let's look at Ephesians 4 verse 1. It says, Therefore I, a prisoner for, this, uh, prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. Let's, what he, let's see what he says to the Philippian church. Only let your manner of life be, there is that word again, worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, what I want to highlight to you here this morning, those two words, worthy, in the original Greek, the root word that he's using there is axios. And axios very simplistically translated is, let's get the balance right. Let's get the scales right. Root word for worthy in English would be worth. In other words, something of value. So let's just put this together so that I even understand what I'm saying. Let's go back to that jacket, that robe of holiness illustration that God uses. You don't deserve it. You cannot pay for it. It's priceless. God puts it on you. However, surely that jacket should impact your life. Surely. You know, let me illustrate it like this. Let's pretend a mommy buys a little boy a smart jacket because he's going to be a page boy at a wedding. What is she going to do to this little boy? She's going to say, Leonard? I don't know where I got that name from. Leonard, this jacket is expensive. It's very expensive. Your pocket money cannot pay for this jacket. I cannot have you, when you're wearing this jacket, you cannot be rolling in the mud or rolling on the floor or climbing the trees or wipe your snot on the sleeve. Some brides have to say the same thing to their grooms at the wedding day. So this mom is saying... Surely, you're going to wear the jacket that reflects its value. God is saying, I want you to wear my jacket of holiness in a way that reflects its value. And when you scream and shout and swear, you're rolling on the floor and playing in the mud with my jacket. And when you disrespect your parents and talk behind their back, you're climbing trees wearing my jacket. And when you sit watching that pornography, you are wiping snot on my jacket. So you know what Paul is saying? Let's get the scales right. Let's try and balance out the life you live in this valuable jacket. Let's try and balance that out between the value of my holy jacket and the life you live in my jacket. In other words, pursue a life that matches the jacket. Pursue a life that matches the jacket, holiness. I just want to go back to that verse in Philippians. Let's just have a look at a different translation here. Paul writes it like this. If you read it in the NLT, I think it was conducting yourselves in a manner that is worthy. And the root word there in the Greek for conducting was be like a citizen. 
This church in Philippi would have clicked this because I don't know if you realize this, Philippi was like an old age home. It was a retirement village for Romans. They loved to go, and, especially the soldiers, that was the place to go and retire. But what was so interesting historically is that those Romans used to bring their life, their Roman life, into Greece, into Philippi, because they were so proud of Rome, so proud of being Roman. They kept the language, they kept the culture, they even built their houses. They wanted to reflect Rome living in Philippi. And surely you and I should lead a life that is so proud of God, so proud of the cross, like we did celebrate it this morning, that you want to live a life that reflects that. In other words, you pursue that with everything that you've got. And then what happens? And so many of you already know this verse already, and maybe you haven't heard it before, but listen to God's promise. In Matthew 6, verse 33, he says, Seek first the kingdom. What is seeking? Pursue. Seek first the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously. That's another way of saying be holy. And look what God says. I will give you everything you need. Do you need happiness? I suppose you do. What's your pursuit? Holiness. Holiness. What about the pursuit of of wisdom. What about that? Let's zoom in on that for a second. Now, I'm going to be reading from the wisdom book. That's what it's coined in the Bible. Of course, that's the book of Proverbs. And I'm going to kicking off right here in the first chapter. I'm going to be reading quite a lot, so just stick with me, but it's quite harsh, so it's entertaining, and it's quite humorous at the same time. But what I want to quickly unpack for you is that wisdom is being spoken about here in this chapter, and God uses a metaphor to describe wisdom. What metaphor does he use? He uses a woman, a lady. That's the symbol. That's the metaphor for wisdom. You say, why on earth would he do that? Well, firstly, I hate to admit admit this, but women are generally wiser than men. Why do I say that? I've got a couple of pictures just to make my point. Have a look. You will never catch women doing things like that. Okay, so we've established women are generally wiser than men, but it's nothing new to us in the 21st century to use an illustration or a metaphor for women. Guys, how often have you spoken about your car, your motorbike, or your fishing rod as your lady and your baby? Okay, so God is using this metaphor as a woman. Now listen to what this woman has to say in Proverbs chapter 1. It says, Lady Wisdom goes out on the street and shouts. At the town center, she makes her speech. In the middle of the traffic, she takes her stand at the busiest corner, she calls out. What does she call? Here we go. Simpletons, morons. Okay, that's just me. How long will you wallow in your ignorance? Cynics, how long will you feed on your cynicism? Idiots, how long will you refuse to learn? About face. In other words, turn around. I will revise your life. Look, I'm ready to pour out my spirit on you. I'm ready to tell you all that I know. As it is, I've called, but you've turned a deaf ear. I've reached out to you, but you've ignored me. Since you laughed at my counsel and make a joke of my advice, how should I take you seriously? I'll turn the tables and joke about your troubles. What if the roof falls in and your whole life goes to pieces? What if catastrophe strikes and there's nothing to show for your life but rubble and ashes? You'll need me then. You'll call for me then, but don't expect me to answer. No matter how hard you look, you won't find me. It's pretty harsh. But it's almost like you didn't pursue me. The wheels have fallen off. There's not much I can do now. That's what it's saying. And when I read that portion, I'm like, you better pursue this woman called wisdom because if not, you're going to be unhappy. In fact, the the metaphor of a woman carries on through several chapters. And I just want to jump here quickly to chapter 8. 8. Verse 34, in the Living Translation, Living Bible, it says, here we go, happy 
is the man who is anxious to be with me, and he watches for me daily at my gates or waits for me outside my home. Note the pursuit is wisdom. The result is happiness. And when I read that verse, I cannot help but see a picture of photographers and reporters outside the home of a celebrity. You know what they like. They're just waiting to catch a glimpse of that, that model, or they're just waiting to catch a glimpse of that royalty. And as the gate opens, they all climb on their mopeds and their bikes, and they start chasing. And that's what, what is being said here. Listen, chase wisdom. Do whatever you can to get her. We should be saying things like, what is the wise thing to do here? Maybe we should just stop and think, what is the wise way to respond here? Or what is the wise thing to say here? Is it really wise for me to go there? Is there someone who's got experience or wisdom that I look up to who can help me in this situation that I face? What does God's word say about this? Is there a good author that is highly respected that's a Christian when it comes to parenting or marriaging or marriages or business? Then I could read that book, just get a glimpse of this woman called Wisdom. No, you know what you and I say? Oh my goodness, I put my foot in it again. What was I thinking? Why did I go there? Why didn't I ask for someone's advice before buying that thing on my credit card? It's a big mess because I went with my feelings. I was a great remorse because I made an impulsive decision. Pursue holiness and pursue wisdom, and happiness gets thrown in for good measure. Pursue happiness. And it leads you, takes you to a destination, to a prize of sorrow. You want to see how this plays out in your life? You see, when you are pursuing holiness with everything that you have, and you're pursuing wisdom with everything that you have as a husband, holiness calls me to treat her like a daughter of God. Holiness calls me to turn that computer off, but wisdom calls me to connect with her, to talk to her, and listen to her. And next thing I find, I have a happy home. How else does this play out in our lives? How about in friendship? When, when I'm pursuing holiness, holiness calls me to forgive them when they, they hurt me. But wisdom calls me to spend time with them because friendship is a function of time. As a parent, when I'm pursuing holiness and wisdom, holiness calls me to live a life that makes it so easy for them to follow, in my example. But wisdom calls me to discipline them. Finances, when I'm pursuing holiness and wisdom, holiness calls me to, this thing, money, don't make it a God, don't worship it, in fact, be generous with it, but wisdom also calls me to save it and to spend it wisely. And guess what happens? People say, how's it that your life is so happy? I don't know, because I'm pursuing holiness and wisdom with everything I've got. Research tells us at two cities on our planet with some of the highest suicide stats in the world, Paris in France and Stockholm, Sweden. Two of the richest, most beautiful cities in the world. We think there's despair in the, in the villages of Africa or the slums of South America and India, but it's in these two powerful rich cities that people wake up trying to figure out why they should live another day. And here we've got Solomon, who tried this and tried this and tried this and wine and woman and song and wells and climbed on a moor train that would never, ever be matched. And at the end of the, the whole thing, he says, meaningless, pointless, smoke and mirrors, it's, it's emptiness. He can't even figure out why he should get out of bed. Right at the end, end, end of Solomon's life. And why do I say that? Well, if the book of Ecclesiastes is the last thing he wrote, then surely the last thing in the book of Ecclesiastes is what we hear pretty much as an old man or on his deathbed. 
And let me just say, when it comes to Solomon, the tragedy of his story is that he started with the pursuit of wisdom and holiness and somewhere got derailed. Somewhere at the end. And this is how he sums up life right at the end of this crazy book. Let's take a look. Here's my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commandments. It's the same as saying, pursue holiness and wisdom. And when you go and read that chapter, it's almost like you can taste the remorse in His voice, almost saying, if only I stuck to that. Hundreds of years later, Jesus would say, you don't gain the world by accumulating as much as you can. You gain the world by giving your life away. You pursue happiness. It's going to take you to a destination, to a prize of sorrow. You think you need to climb on a more train, more pleasure, more power, more knowledge, whatever you... It, it doesn't work. You need to pursue Holiness. I've put a jacket of righteousness, of holiness. Let's try and get the scales right between the value of that jacket and the life you live in that jacket. Pursue a life that matches my jacket. And wisdom, it's a metaphor. She's a lady and she's saying, I'm, I want to help you. Chase after me. Pursue me. And when you catch me, when you get me, I'll throw happiness as a freebie. Pursue happiness Sorrow, holiness, wisdom, happiness gets thrown in as a byproduct. Come, let's stand. Shall we pray? I think, Lord, if we're really honest with ourselves this morning, all of us are on some kind of more train. And we think if I could just have more breakthrough in the work situation 2019, or if I can just land a husband this year, or if I could just get an increase, then I'm going to be happy. And I'm chasing something that is like vapor, that is empty, that is meaningless. Lord, I need to pursue a life that makes you proud because I'm proud of you. Try and live a life that matches the value of this robe of holiness that you've clothed me. May I pursue this crazy thing, this metaphor of wisdom, Father. Because then I realize I start putting my marriage together. I start putting parenting together. I start putting the business together. And you throw in happiness as a freebie. Help me, God, I pray. Amen. Bless you. See you next time.